Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm proud to have joining me Coach Cade Lemke from the Blue Ridge School in yeah, outside Charlottesville, Virginia. And he talks about leaving Rochester, New York to go do a postgrad year at Hargrave Military. And his team had three NBA players on it. He talks about practices, talks about playing in Madison Square Garden, and then ultimately his choice to play at Virginia in the ACC. Uh, he ran some AU programs. He coached the year D1 at Longwood, and now he's been at Blue Ridge School for 10 years. And I'm happy to have him on because Blue Ridge School um, is unique to where it's all boys, which he explains the benefits of that. And they also have to do other afternoon activities on top of basketball, which he explains the benefits of that. And they had a player there named uh, Mamadi Diatki, uh, who won a state title at Blue Ridge. He won a national title with the Virginia Cavaliers and won an NBA title with the uh, Milwaukee Bucks. So doing other activities did not impend or impede his progress on getting to the highest level. Uh, a little bit of uh, recording difficulties at the end, so we end kind of abruptly. But uh, enjoy this podcast with my friend, Coach Cade Lemke. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. Maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Cade, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for inviting me, Corey. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, excited to have you. And you grew up in Rochester, New York, and you decided after graduation to do a post-grad year at Hargrave Military Academy. One, where'd you learn about a post-grad year? And two, why'd you pick Hargraves? Sure. The, I didn't know much about the post-grad opportunities. I think in Western New York, when I grew up, they didn't talk about that much. There were some hockey players that left my private school in Rochester to go to a school, but outside of that, did not hear much about it as I got into the spring of my senior year and wasn't really being recruited in the level I was excited about, but not the part of the country where I wanted to go. We looked at some different options. I really wanted to go to school down South. And so as we looked at this whole idea of post-grad opportunities, at the time there were really only military schools as the options down South of the Mason Dixon line. And so I think we looked at, we looked at Fork Union. Traveled down there, visited the campus, worked out for the late uh, Coach Fletcher Errett. And uh, it was it was late in the game. By the time we got down there, I think it was the end of June, beginning of July. And he was already kind of down the, down the road and only had one spot left on his roster. And uh, kept me warm, but wasn't told me to not wait on them if another opportunity presented itself. At the same time, Hargrave had reached out to me. They had heard that I was, that I was looking for a post-grad spot and uh, the coach Scott Shepard, uh, he connected with me and he actually had played for Coach Eric at Fork Union. And when I told him that I really enjoyed my visit there and I was waiting to hopefully get on there with Coach Eric, he said, you know, it makes makes a ton of sense. You know, maybe we'll reconnect, you know, down the road if something, you know, if something doesn't work out, you know, it doesn't work out there. Excuse me. Bless you. And so uh, we kind of waited on Fork Union and then Coach Eric called and told me that he had gotten a, a commitment from a kid from uh, Louisiana, like a 6'10", 6'11", a kid who UCLA was was recruiting and trying to find a place for. And so he told me that they were going to go with him. And that left us kind of uh, hanging, you know, for, for a little bit. Um, but as uh, God's plan would have it, about a week later, Coach Shepard reconnected with me and just wanted to check to see if anything had changed on my end. And um, I told him, actually, the Fork Union didn't work out. And I was interested in Hargrave. And he said, he said, if you've looked at Fork Union and you think that that's doable, then Hargrave will be a breeze because we're not as strict um, or as regimented as Fork Union. So I remember he sent me a VHS tape, a little uh, of the of the campus. You know, we we're kind of getting down to the end. And we said, let's do it. So I never visited Hargrave before I, before I got there. But a week after that, Coach Era had called me back and said that another spy had opened up um, at Fork Union, but I had already committed to going to Hargrave. And so that's what, that's what got me, you know, got me down there, you know, nine hours, 10 hours from home, a long drive, you know, through uh, not only New York and PA, but then into Virginia and Virginia kept going further and further. And 
I arrived at, at Hargrave. That was a, a great experience for me back in the, what, fall of 97 when I arrived there. Yeah, and you get there, and you end up playing with three future NBA players, to include Corleone Young, who got drafted straight to the NBA from Hargrave. So you also had other big-time players in that team as well. So talk to me what it was like going from you know, your high school in Rochester to these kind of practices. Like, What were practices and games like, and how long did it take you to like catch up to speed, or did you hit the ground running when you got there? Yeah, I think you know my work ethic was never – you know, an, an issue for me growing up. I think I worked as hard or harder than, you know, any of my peers and basketball peers, so to speak. When I got to Hargrave, what I, what I realized was now, instead of only being able to work, you know, in the gym by myself or with another, you know, another kid who maybe was the same grade as me, but didn't have the same aspirations that I had, or maybe a, a former a teammate when he was home from college and so you'd only get a chance to work out every once in a while. Now I'm surrounded by, you know, 10 or 11 other like-minded individuals, right? Some of them had a great work ethic. Some of them, you know, left something to be desired, but everyone was super talented. Everyone was competitive. And so now these workouts, it was another level, right? Where you had to bring it, you know, you had to bring it every day. And you had to start figuring out how can I add value in more ways than just right? Scoring the ball or blocking that shot or, right, getting that dunk, whatever you might have been able to do at the high school level. It was, an, I mean, this was, this was, right, a post-grad opportunity, a college prep opportunity, right, where it was giving me a taste of what it was going to be like at the next level. And so we had basketball class during the, during the day, right? So as post-grads, we had, you know, an hour and a half or two hours during the day before we had practice in the afternoon. And then any other free time getting back on the court at night. But it was uber competitive where you were just battling all the time, right? And so what I always tell people is you don't know how much better you're getting because you're you're in you're in the thick of it, right? You're in the trenches, then you might go right a day and not even get right an open look, right? Or you might be scored on, you know, four or five times in a row, which you're not used to, and you might think, I'm not getting better, this is too tough. But what you don't know is so I try to impart on others that are going through a process like this, whether it's a postgrad program or high level prep school, you know, because everyone is working hard, everyone has the same, the same goals. You don't understand that, right? Iron sharpens iron. Everyone is getting better. Mm -hmm. So you might not think you're getting better. And it wasn't until I got home, played in a men's league, I think it was that next spring back in Rochester, playing with guys who I would played with right, the year before, and my game was completely different, right? And so I there realized how much better I had gotten. So even though when I was going through it, I didn't think I was getting getting better because everybody was, right, was getting better. All of a sudden, I put myself against other people who were not with me, who didn't have the, the last 12 months that I had, and I saw, right, the leaps that were made in my game, which I think I was then done at Hargrave, but you know, if you were, if you're going to a prep school and you experienced that and you still had another year or two after that experience, now you attack that next season, that next right fall with a whole different level of confidence and uh, optimism because you know now that you were getting better, right? Because when you're going through it, you were like, shoot, this is before cell phones, right? This is barely, there was barely internet. And so, you know, you, you were away from your family, you know, away from your girlfriend, all these things. And like, is it really, you know, is it really worth it? But I mean, the level of competition and just the opportunity just to compete daily in whatever drills or whatever was going on was a super, a super high level for me and something that, you know, I think helped me take my game, you know, to the next level for sure. Absolutely. And during that year, you guys actually played at Madison Square Garden. Walk me through that. Like what, what was the matchup that everyone was looking for? Yeah. So, so because Corleone Young right, was on our, was on our team, right? He was the number one rated high school player in the country that year. So we're, where a bunch of us were post grads that year, he was a high school senior, right, playing. And so because of because of him, we had the opportunity to play in some really neat events right around the country. And so we played against St. Patrick's, which they had the number two or number three player in the country. Al Harrington was a senior at St. Pat's. Kevin Boyle uh, was the coach was the coach there. And so the game was at Madison Square Garden. And so here we are. We stayed at the Downtown Athletic Club 
was our hotel. We had a private practice at some, you know, some gym just down the road from the hotel, which was super high, super high level. And then we're here we are playing at the garden against St. Pat's. And it was, uh, I mean, it was a great, it was a great game. We, you know, we won in the closing, the closing seconds. I think Corleone, Corleone had like 22 points, 20 rebounds. And then Al had like 27 points, 10 rebounds. I mean, the two just, I mean, they battled. And I think we had more, you know, talent from, you know, number one to number 10 than they had. And I think that's allowed us to squeak out the win at the end. But um, being on that stage and playing in the garden was was a neat, a neat experience that even playing there a couple of years later in college, like it, it wasn't the same as when you were just at a prep school environment, getting to play at the guard. It was pretty special. That's awesome. That is an awesome experience to have. And just, just you being able to play and watch that game must've been cool. So that's, that's pretty neat. After post-grad year at Hargrave, you chose to play at the University of Virginia. Walk me through your decision-making to choose that program. Sure. So my whole goal was to be recruited to play the same same level, low low division one, mid division one, but I wanted to play in the South. And so my time at Hargrave was just trying to find that opportunity to play, you know, at that same level down down here. And so I visited a bunch of a bunch of schools, Furman, Coastal Carolina, Richmond, JMU, and they all had, you know, really good coaches and it was a neat uh, neat opportunity. Well, right then at that same, that same time, February, March, the University of Virginia had their, had a coaching change. And so Jeff Jones was, uh, uh, was let go and they hired Pete Gillen, who had just had a great run at Providence and they made it to the elite eight. And so when coach Gillen got the job, he needed to fill a few more roster spots and he came down to, you know, to watch, to watch us at Hargrave and then brought me up to, to Virginia and told me that. You know, he didn't have a scholarship for me right now, but if I if I came and um, you know, earned my way and and proved my value on the court that I could earn a scholarship, but that he needed a player, you know, needed a player like me as he was taking over this, you know, this program. And I knew of you know, I I grew up in Rochester. I mean, you're a Syracuse fan, you know, first, but I was a big, you know, ACC fan. This is obviously before Syracuse was in the ACC, and so. I knew of Virginia, but didn't necessarily know just how highly thought of UVA was. And so I remember coming back from my visit and talking to the professors and some of the administration at Hargrave. And once I told them there was an opportunity to go to Virginia, you know, they all told me right away, like, this is life changing. The education that you would get, the networks that you would make, you know, during your time there, it's a no brainer. Right. So obviously people in state, especially, well, they love, they love UVA. And so I took that and I think I was still confident in my ability and thought I could play at that level, even though I wasn't being recruited um, at that level, you know, during the year. And so I ended up jumping at it and I, I took that, uh, took it and made my way to Charlottesville from Chatham where, where Hargrave is and found myself, you know, playing in the, in the ACC and right there in the middle of love it all. And it was a neat, a neat experience for me and just the players that I played with, the coaches that I played for, um, the opportunities that I had, you know, I, I definitely would not have gotten right at one of the other options that I had. And yeah, I look back on it as, you know, it was, a, it was a neat experience and, you know, with anything, you know, there's pros and cons and you, by making that decision, you probably turned down other things that you could have gotten somewhere else, but, but it's allowed me to kind of get to where I am now. And so I can't be, uh can't be upset about that. It's been, it's been great. A great yeah, run. That's life. I mean, a different phone call. You could have been on Fork Union too. So you start thinking right. like that it can drive you crazy. So, uh, mm -hmm. all right. So between, um, you know, your time of Virginia and getting to Blue Ridge, one of those years you spent as an assistant at a D1 program called Longwood. What did you learn being a D1 assistant? You know, now that you're at a prep school, you know, most of the people you talk to and I talk to have the goal of playing D1, but you were there for that year. What did you really learn from that on the coaching side that you now use both in coaching and helping players get recruited? Yeah, you know, I think there was, as I was done playing and wanted to get into coaching and I had a, an AAU program that I ran for 12 years and the, probably the, the last four years of that, I was running it really with the idea and the goal to get into college coaching and I wanted to get to the Division One Division One level. And you kind of have this, this, this dream and this outlook that you think, this perspective that you think I'm going to get to 
you know, get paid to coach, to coach hoops all day. I get to work with all these types of players. I get to work with the rest of a staff of guys that all want to win. And we're going to, you know, we're going to make it to March and we're going to go dancing and, you know, all, you know, and so you have this, this vision. And even as I talk to peers of mine who are coaching at that level, they would be quick to tell you, you know, uh, it's a grind. You don't want to do it. Like you're going to have to, you have a family, you have, you know, kids, you're not going to see them. And it's super, you know, super intense. I mean, it's, it's cutthroat. Like, you know, they say all these things. And as a naive, you know, guy who's reaching and trying to get there, you know, I think, oh, that can't be that bad. You know, they're just, they just don't want another, another person in the, you know, in the business, you know, they want to be able to, you know, keep their, you know, keep their, their relationships intact and, and know that they have, you know, me on the AAU or the prep side and not, you know, as another college coach. So the opportunity presented itself for me to go to Longwood and play in the big South for uh, coach Jason G and my family is very, very supportive you know, of that. We moved, yeah, we moved to Farmville and it was a first year for coach G, right? So as your, your, your first year as the head coach at a school, you're really trying to build, you know, build that culture. And, and it was, it was a grind, right? I mean, the, yeah. you know, just the amount of time that you spend away from your family, just all these different moments that you, you know, that you miss. And then on the recruiting side, you're, you're really betting everything on your ability to right to convince a 17 18 year old you know teenager to come to your right to come to your school and you know in the world where you know on the recruiting side coaches will tell you anything they might not be quite as truthful right about certain things and what's going on it was a it was really trying because as we we're recruiting kids and trying to recruit against other coaches and other schools, and you know the pitches that are being made, and you know that you might have the best interest of the of the kid, maybe more so than somebody else. But if somebody else is selling a bigger a bigger dream, you could you could lose them. And then if you don't get that kid, and you end up with a right a lesser kid or a lesser kid, you know that could be the difference between winning and losing. And then that comes back, that comes back on the head of right, the assistant coaches who are out there supposedly recruiting and bringing in, right, bring. that was a, that was big, you know, for me, because I've, in my, on my AAU side, and then here at Blue Ridge, I mean, I, I make a living on being fully transparent, authentic, and genuine with my relationships with, with not only the players, but the players' families, and it was a lot harder in that situation to, you know, to do that there at Longwood, and so, Getting through that year, I realized, you know, that I can say that all D1 situations are the same, right? Because every coaching staff, every program is different. You know, there's, it's, you know, if, if I really want to be able to run a program the way that I want to run it, and I want to be able to impact lives the way that I want to impact lives, I need to be a head coach and I need to be in a situation where there's, there's not the same crazy pressure to win or lose your job or recruit this high level kid or lose your job. And then that's kind of when, when the opportunity presented itself to come to, right, to come to Blue Ridge, which was, right, a whole different, uh, whole different thing for me. Yeah. And tell us about that. Now that you've gotten to Blue Ridge, tell us about the school. Tell us about your program. What's your pitch to family? Sure. So, so we're tucked away. So I've, I've been in Blue Ridge. I just finished my 10th year and yeah, we're, Right at the base of the Blue Ridge Mountains, Central Virginia, we're about 30 minutes outside of Charlottesville, where the University of Virginia is. We're about an hour from Harrisonburg, where JMU is, about two hours from D.C. All boys, you know, college prep school, right? 180 kids, about 30% are international. 80% of us as faculty live on the campus. And so we are, you know, we're, we're here. You know, and so I was, I was familiar with Blue Ridge and some of the other schools in the Virginia area from when I was on the AU side and when I was at Longwood. So I was always intrigued by Blue Ridge. I went to uh, McQuaid Jesuit High School in Rochester, which was an all-boys all boys school. And so I knew the value of, of being in a single-sex uh, education where you could really focus limited, limited distractions around you and you could you know, really work on your craft, right, whatever that was. And so I was excited about that, but I was really excited about a boarding environment where 
you have kids 24 seven, right? So your, your players are, if is they're here, they're not right. Going home, you know, each night and going into a different environment. They're not going home on the weekend into a different environment. You've got a collection of 10, 12, 13 young men who all are hungry about the game or they have sacrificed to, to be there and they are ready to be molded, right? 24, 24, seven. And so what I tell, I tell families all the time is this isn't for everyone, but if you are, if you're a young player or you're the, you're the parent of a young player who wants to be good and isn't nervous about being a smaller fish in a big pond, then there's no better, no better place to be. I've got three assistant coaches. All four of us live on campus. So, right, the, the varsity gym is right down the walking path. The field house with three more courts is right down the walking path. The, you know, the high level weight room, like the track, I mean, everything is right there. There's no excuse possible that, that, that would prevent you from just improving your game. Yes, we play right at super high level in terms of competition. The players are high level. So similar to my experience at Hargrave, you're getting pushed every day. And you have to really bring it and figure out how you can add value, even if you're not making your shot or you're not right able to lock up that guy on defense. You've got to figure out how to still create value. And I think our guys, as they go through their time here, they improve by leaps and bounds, right? Physically, mentally, emotionally. But they are so much better prepared when they get to the next level to now as freshmen at D1, D2, D3, whatever it is, they can now attack attack it and carve out a role and create value so much sooner than their peers that aren't in the environment that they're in. You know, and I hear that all the time, you know, from college coaches who recruit our guys when they have them and they, they're just shocked at how, at how fast they move up the learning curve. Cause I mean, our guys have already had a roommate. Our guys have already been eating in a, in a dining hall. Our guys have already been away from home. Right. Our guys have already dealt with having multiple workouts a day and playing against right great competition or being just a one piece, a role player, or having a, a role and not being the being the guy that can have six turnovers and your coach never yells at you or take twenty five shots and you know, whether you make them or you miss them, you're still gonna play the entire game, right? Our our guys have been through all of this and it allows them to be, you know, just more valuable sooner right at the next level. And so when, when families hear that and they genuinely feel and see how their son or how them as a player could be a part of what we're, what we're building, I think it's a, it's an easy decision. If everything else works out that they could be here. And we've, we've been blessed to have some really great players with great families and uh, been able to put some things together here during my time. All right. One clarification, you guys don't offer a post-grad year. So for those of you all listening, you got to go in before you graduate high school to Blue Ridge and you guys don't take one year seniors except in very rare situations. Correct. Yeah. Co right. But guys can reclassify. So if they're trying Correct. to get that additional year in high school and reclass as a ninth or 10th or an 11th grader, they could do that. But yes, there is no post-grad program or no ability to reclass as a senior. Okay. Now here's one challenge that I get when I talk about all boys schools is kids will balk at that. Parents will balk at that. And after coaching two years at Gonzaga in D.C., which was an all-boys school, my attitude's completely changed on it, and I think it's an excellent option. And I'm just curious, what do you say when families balk about just being a single-sex school? Sure. Well, so the right the the positives right is that you can you can focus. You don't have to worry about you know what's this girl you know thinking when I answer this question in class today. What's this girl thinking when I'm you know at practice and I miss I miss a shot in front of other people? I can just Right. I can focus. I can focus on my right on my craft and what I'm doing. Then the downside is you don't have females at school. Well, I think Blue Ridge and other right single sex schools do. I don't want to speak for all of them, but we do a really good job of organizing weekend activities with other schools every weekend. So I think there are four all girls schools in Virginia and every weekend there's a either a mixer or a different like going to a a college football game or these different events where you get to mingle with girls from one of these other schools. So you still right, have your opportunity to, to meet people and to have, right, to have fun. But that's just right. Then on the weekend, then you get to be right back at 
business, so to speak, working at, at accomplishing and achieving all your goals. And so you, you still are around it. And I think Blue Ridge does a great job at that, but you now get to right focus and grow in a way that you can't right at a co-ed school. Yeah. I agree with that a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Um, and a lot of my families, they're, they're moving kids from sometimes another country to America to play in prep school ball. You're not going there for a girlfriend. You're calling me up. You're hiring me to play basketball. You got your whole life for girls. So I think it's a great idea. Now, you know, when you and I have connected on players, they'll talk to you and they'll also might be talking to a New England prep school. And with New England prep schools, they got the concentration up there, right? So it's a lot easier for college coaches to hit a bunch of them during multiple days. Uh, how do you answer that when families ask, like, well, shouldn't I go to New England versus Virginia to get more exposure to college coaches? What's your comeback line to that? Yeah, I think the we're in a unique situation where we are in Virginia because you have you have three of the most storied post grad programs all within, you know, two hours of us. So Fork Union, who we've talked about in Hargrave and Massanut, and we're kind of like right in between. If you draw a triangle between those three, we're right there. And so our pitch to college coaches, and I think we've able we've been able to not only get coaches to come and watch us play, obviously the biggest group is always in the fall, but even during the season, not only because we have good players, but because it's an easy an easy trip for them. And now as a college coach, and I remember being there, like when you're, you need to make the most of your time, right? If you're going to yeah. be away from your family, if you're going to be away from your team and not at practice today, right? It better, it better and drive right six hours or fly, take two flights just to watch one kid. If you can all of a sudden watch three different schools or four different schools at one time, that's, that's when it makes, it makes sense for you. And so where we're located, Right, it allows us to right to do that, right? Probably in a very similar way to New England, where but New England might have ten or twelve schools within a four hour right radius. We have right four schools here, not to mention some of the other day schools that tend to have some really good players in Richmond or Charlottesville or uh, up towards DC. So yes, so right, so we we have that same consortium, so to speak, of, of schools and of basketball talent that New England has, but just not. Yo, know, not up there, freezing your freezing your butt off after the year. That's right. And just full disclosure, when I met you for the first time, uh, you know, I had visited Fort Union and Hargrave, and then came to see you because it was all right there. So yeah, absolutely makes sense. Uh, all right, here's something a challenge you guys have as well. Um, a lot of my basketball families reach out; they want to go someplace and play basketball every day of the year to prep school. But your school, like some other prep schools, require students to do other activities on top of that. What do you say to families that just want to focus on basketball when you present to them that they do have to try something different athletic? Sure. Yeah. So, so we have, right. So we have our act afternoon activity all year right? in the, in this, in the fall, you have an afternoon activity in the winter, in the spring, in the winter, you can use basketball as your afternoon activity. So that's, that's easy. But in the fall and in the spring, you have to choose a different activity, right? It could be a sport, right? You might play soccer, or play football, or run cross country. It might be doing robotics. It might be uh, being part of the community service program. Uh, might be p being part of our outdoor program and learning how to canoe or how to uh, rock climb. But you do this in the afternoon for 90 minutes. And, at first, right, some people might look at that and say, I could use those 90 minutes to either, right, study more math or practice basketball or get in the weight room. The beauty of a of a boarding school like ours is there is still so much time in the day that you can still accomplish all that you want to accomplish in the weight room, on the court, getting extra shots up, watching film. You can do all that and still right study and stay on top of your classes and still eat th three good meals right a day and still have your right your your full slate of classes and your afternoon activity each day and still get plenty of rest at night, you can do that because when you're, when you take out the sucks at our time, when you're in a day school environment, right? And you're traveling to and from school or you're sitting on the couch watching TV, you know, at night, or you're, you're on the phone, right? Talking to your friends or whatever for 30 minutes or you're, or you're playing your video games for an hour. Like when you take those things out of your day, you realize just how much time you have. 
So now if, if I have a different afternoon activity, let's say I'm playing a different sport, right? Obviously there's some, some, um, cross sport, you know, uh, positives of, you know, maybe it's conditioning, right? You're able to condition a different way. Maybe you're playing, you're running track in the spring and there's a track coach that is teaching you something about your, your confidence level or the men being mentally tough that maybe, right. I didn't, wasn't able to keep teach or coach you the same way during the basketball season. Now you get that right as well. And now one of the things that I really like with our guys is when they're doing some of those other activities, let's say they're doing, they're doing robotics and they might be high on the totem pole when they're on the basketball court, but all of a sudden now they're behind, you know, they're in front of a computer and a keyboard and they're at the bottom. Right. So now, now they're being humbled and they're now having to rely on a teammate, a robotics teammate that, and the other parts of the, of campus might always be looking up to them. Well, now they're, they're being, they're being the one that's in charge. They're being the one that, that everyone is knows, oh, you really know what you're doing. And so I think there's also some positive growth opportunities for, for our guys when you're doing something that you're not as comfortable with, or you're not as good as, as good at. And, and, what other opportunity might you have your, your entire life to do some of those things? You might never have learned how to canoe, right? You might never learn how to fly fish or learn how to right, be in the drama and learn how to act. But now because this afternoon activity is built into our day, you can, you can do that and not sacrifice time on the court. You're getting better. So I think it, it works out, even though it's hard to, to understand in the beginning. But I think once you really realize and you talk to people who have been through it and you see and you find out, just how much time they still have and how it didn't take away from their ability to grow as a basketball player either. Yeah. A couple of things I want to say on that kid. One, put down your phone, right? You'll be amazed how much time comes from that. The other thing is, you know, these basketball academies out there, one of their big pitches is you can have six hours in the gym. Another basketball academy might say, we have eight hours in the gym. Another might say, we've got, you know, 23 out of 24 hours. You can be in the gym at our basketball academy. But you've won state titles. You've got Mamadi who won a state title. You want an NCAA title with Virginia. You want an NBA title with the Bucks. Like you're doing this other stuff. It's only making you a more well-rounded person. It's helping your sport, like you just said. And if you still spend the right quality of time in the gym during that time you've got it, you're going to improve. It's about quality, not quantity. All these hours that some of these coaches spew out there of time you get in the gym. Well, sure, no one is in the gym for 10 hours going full speed. You can't. If you're going full speed, you know, game speed 30 minutes you're gassed right if you're even shaped to go that long so i like that you shared that because some students do get worried about you know the loss of like time on the court or instruction but your track record with the high major players you've had come through there the, the state championships the placement uh, it's just it, it it proves itself so i think it's a great idea i know you know there are people that just want to do basketball you know one of my clients worst case scenario played football and got hurt so you couldn't play the basketball season. That's life. You could get hurt anytime you step out your front door. So you do need to look at that worst case scenario. But don't play football. Play a different sport. Do community service. Do canoeing. And you guys being right there, you know, in the middle of the Blue Ridge Mountains, you know, still 20 minutes from Charlottesville. What a great opportunity you got there. So anyway, I just wanted to piggyback on what you said that I think this is a good thing, right? Yeah. What do you see as the future of prep school basketball? I mean, you've been doing this for a long time now, 10 years, like you said. You've seen it evolve. Now we've got NIL. Now I've got transfers. Is prep school basketball got a good future in your eye? Do you see more demand? Or is the, you know, um, adding of new academies out there diluting it a little? What are your right, thoughts? So, so we had, a, we had a big influx right after the pandemic, right, where prep schools were, you know, more people wanted to go there because they wanted to get that year back reclassify because of limited opportunity during during the pandemic now i think we're back to what we were you know before you know i i there's just a, there's more of an opportunity to really educate those families that are out there i think there's there's still the same number right of families that are looking to go to somewhere right for school but there are more of these basketball academies out there and for some for some kids some families that might make sense yeah. right those those schools tend to have a much lower price tag where they're just, they know what they, what the cost is and the kid will go there and the kid's going to stay in a, in a house with some other players and get in a, get in a team van and go to the gym every day or whatever, you know, whatever it is. It's not a, it's not a school environment, right? And so if you're a family that's looking for a school, 
right experience, the basketball academy is not going to give you that. But for some kids, the basketball academy is exactly right is exactly what they need. And taking online classes is easy and fine, and they don't have necessarily big aspirations of of growing as a student, more so just doing whatever has to be done so that they can open the door for the next level. You're gonna you're still gonna find that. I think for us, we're in a fortunate position when you've had some success, not only in terms of winning, but you've had success at players going on and playing at the next level and your networks continue to grow, you're going to, you're going to have opportunity to right get in front of families. And then I've always felt that we're going to get the families we're supposed to get, right? We're going to get the players that we're supposed to get. And so we're going to, we're going to put our pitch together. We're going to explain everything that we have to offer. And if it's what you you know, what you, what you need and what you want, let's make it happen. If for some reason you think there's another situation that might be better, you know, good luck, you know, good luck to you. I mean, we, we've had a couple of players in my 10 years here who made a decision to do something else. And, you know, within a couple of months or within a year, you know, they end up, you know, calling back and saying, Hey, right. do you, do you have, do you have spot one, one of those situations we had room and we were able to work with that family. The other situation, we didn't have a spot anymore. But I think, you know, it, it'll be interesting, you know, with NIL in the future, like what's going to, what's going to happen. I heard, you know, there was a, a very talented player on the other, the other side of the state from us who's, who I heard his dad was all about going to OTE because he, you know, they wanted an NIL deal. And so the dad's a, but at the end of the day, like that's probably not the family that I want to coach anyway. You know, if, if the family is that into that. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes there's a difference between the, the, the player and the family, right? We've been, in, we've been in situations where I think we made the situation as the best possible for a player because he got away from his family. And in a boarding environment, now he's with us. He doesn't have to listen to all the noise or the negativity or the discouragement, right? And that's what allowed him to flourish, right? And do, and do well. Um, and sometimes we can be that, right? We can be that spot. There's been other, other, I still remember a family that we had who they were so close as a family. It was definitely a positive, positive influence. The family was, and they, they said several times, coach, we cannot see our son leaving us for his last, you know, we were already prepared for him to leave when he goes to college. We're not ready for him to leave now. And you know, we talked about it and they went home and, you know, they prayed about it, talked about it more, thought about it more. And they did, ended up deciding to give it a try. He spends two years with us, has a great, right, great career, goes on to play college basketball. And now as a college coach and his family would say it was the best decision they ever made, even though it was the hardest decision they made because they were not prepared for him to leave sooner. And he was definitely getting, I mean, all the positive reinforcement, everything by being at home. So it wasn't like he was escaping a bad, negative situation at home. But they said, as hard as it was, we cannot believe the young man that he turned into. We cannot believe the the basketball experience that he got and the doors that were opened. And now where he is to this day. Um, and even though they say it was hard, but they said it was the best best decision. And, it, and it's and it's easy. It's it's not easy for families, right? Because it, it's, it's a sacrifice financially. It's a sacrifice right time with your, with your, but if we can continue just to get in front of the right, the right families, I think, you know, we'll have the opportunity to really coach, coach some up and change, change some lives, which is what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to impact, impact these lives. And, and I look at it as a responsibility. Here I am. I've been married for 21 years. I've got three kids. I live in the same place where all these students live. My 12 players I'm modeling every day what it means to be a husband, what it means to be a father, what it means like they, they see all my interactions with my wife. They see all my interactions with my kids. And that might be the only modeling that they've ever seen. Right. Or, or maybe they already have, right. A positive male role model at home. And now they see another one, which just reinforces, right. The, the path to go down. And so I don't take that lightly that. Every day I have not only my 12 players, right? 180, right? Boys that are watching, you know, that are watching me. And so to, to have that chance to be able to impact, uh, you know, impact lives. I mean, that, that's why, that's why I'm still here. That's why I love, 
I love what I do. And my family is also, you know, on board with, with doing this. It's been a great, a great run. Cade, what does it take to be a guard at the D1 level? So you have to, you have to be a at something, I think to be right to be now that could be, you could be an elite shooter. You could be an elite on the ball defender. You could be an elite athlete. You could be an elite connector, right? Or high IQ player, but you, you, you need to be elite at something, right? And then, and then the other side is you better, you better be able to compensate for any weaknesses you have by being that much better at something else. You know, I, high school guys, and I still remember, I still remember taking a, a visit to St. Bonaventure when I was in, when I was in high school and they had, they had offered me and we then were at a team camp that summer at St. Bonaventure. And I remember the coach pulled me aside after one of our games at the team camp. And he said, and he talked about how there was this loose ball on the floor. And I didn't, I didn't dive on the floor for the loose ball. I either like bent over to try to pick it up or I let somebody else pick it up. And he said, at the, at the next level, you can't just like bend over to pick up that ball. Like you're, you're not good enough to be able to, to do that. And this, this is me as a, I was a going into my junior year of high school. It's like, it kind of went in and went in one ear out the other. It wasn't until I got to Virginia when all of a sudden I'm not, I'm probably the least athletic on the floor. I'm, and I don't have the same margin for error. And I better do all the little things to make up for not being as fast or as strong as, as another, right. As another guard that I was, that's when I started realizing you better pursue that ball. You better dive on that floor for every loose ball. You better take every charge that you can, that you can take because I didn't have the other, the other parts of my, my game, especially on the athleticism side to do it any other way. Like I had to do those right to do those little things. And so now when, when I'm coaching guys that want to play right at that level or, or I'm just mentoring or giving advice to others, unless you're an Uber, an Uber athlete that can just run and jump and do like, you better be super elite at something. And then you better be willing to do all the things that most people aren't willing to do, right? When it comes to taking charges, dive for loose balls, setting, setting great screens, right? Those are all like these little things that you better be able to do. And I, I think. Hopefully I get that point across to, you know, to our guard one in division two level. And, you know, we've been able to impart that, you know, that wisdom they, they learn, right. How to, how to do it. And I think that positions themselves pretty well when they get to the next level to be successful. Love it. Thanks for sharing that. Um, um we're going to end with some, some quick hitters here, right? right? What, what, who's, who's the best player, best player you ever Steve Francis at Maryland when I was in Virginia and uh, we played him and and I still remember it was a switch and I was switched on to him. And I still remember we were in front of our bench playing up at Cole Fieldhouse and a couple teammates of mine on the bench started laughing when I got switched on to Steve Francis. Obviously, he was a great college player, great NBA player, but he was, he was the toughest player I played against. Best player you've ever played against at prep school. He wasn't, he wasn't great in the game that we played, but he was great that whole year. But Shea Gilchrist Alexander, we played him when he was at Hamilton Heights. And uh, we, we won the game and he had already committed to Kentucky and you could tell he was going to be good. And I think we were able to slow him down a little bit, but he was, he was a talent. His favorite movie or one of them. One. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say one that, you know, Hoosiers is a, is a classic. I love uh, just growing up as a, as a basketball player and have, and just loving, loving the game. That was a, uh, a, a great one to be, to always have in the, on the VHS tape or in the DVD player or whatever it might've been. Perfect. Perfect. Is there anything, is there anything we, we didn't, didn't touch on yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think, I mean, I, it's amazing the resources that are out there now for families and for players that are looking for these, for these opportunities. I think to play at a post-grad or at a prep school when they're in high school, I think when I was, when I was growing up and in, in this situation, we didn't know, right, we didn't have anybody to turn to. I think we ended up, there was, there was no right prep schools or anything like that. And uh, we were blessed to, to end up with a situation that we, we had at Hargrave, but it's just so unique now for players, right? Domestic players, international players to be able to, right, connect with somebody like you and, and 
just be able to to learn and to be so much better informed, not only, and I, I always think, call you a matchmaker, because as you know more and more of the programs that are out there, and you get to know these these players, the families, right, you're able to put, put these kids in situations where they still have to make the decision at the end of the day, but can imagine the time that they would spend and who some of their quote unquote final schools might be if they were just jumping online, talking to their neighbor, doing whatever and finding, finding things. So I think, you know, I've, I've obviously been, been fortunate to know you and to become close with you and to know, and you know me and what I'm trying to do, but it's, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, just the different, the different guys that I've been able to coach that you've worked with. And even some that I wasn't able to coach, but we were able to at least get to know those families and they chose to go other places. I feel good that they made informed decisions, even if they didn't end up here at Blue Ridge, that I think it's uh, just a unique thing that right 10, 20, 30 years ago wasn't the case. So I applaud, I applaud you for everything that, that you're doing to help, you know, help these kids and these families, because I know there, there are a bunch of them out there that'd be making very poor decisions otherwise. So thank you for that. Well, I appreciate, well, I appreciate that. that. Uh, okay. Thanks so much for being on. I will put all your contact information in the uh, show notes and um, so people can find you at Blue Ridge School, everything else. Good luck this year. And thanks so much for coming on the podcast. 